all of you moms and dads out there this morning, and all of you sons and daughters. Anybody left out? Have you ever said or heard a child say, but that's not fair? Anybody? Ever said that or heard your child say that, right? It's not fair. It's common. And did you have to teach your child to say that? No. Somehow they just seem to know how to say that on their own. Isn't that true? And I, in my observation, in my own family, there's two parental responses to the that's not fair phrase. One is parents who try to justify and explain, oh, yes, it is fair. You see, she has three presents, but your one present costs as much as her three presents, so it really is fair, right? You do that, you try to explain why it's really fair. And then there's the other response, which is, yes, that's right, kid, life's not fair. You know, get used to it. We do both sometimes. Why, why do we grow up expecting life to be fair? Where does that come from? We've all said it. We've all thought it. Our culture does seem intent on uh, convincing us that life owes us some measure of fairness. We hear it all the time when it's political season, election season, about the inequity of this world and life. And I've met many people who carry this notion of fairness over into their religion or their relationship with God. If they don't say with their mouth, they certainly think with their mind and feel with their heart, that's not fair. That's not fair, God. They face some terrible disappointment. Life doesn't pan out the way they thought it would, and they feel like they've done a good job and towed the line, and they think and feel, God, that's not fair. In Psalm 73, the psalmist is a, psalm, a guy named Asaph, like an ancient worship leader for the people of Israel. And in that psalm, he says, Surely in vain I've kept my hands clean when I envy the prosperity of the wicked. His point is this. I look around, and those that thumb their nose at you, God, seem to do just fine. But here I am trying hard to do what's right, and my life is hard. That's not fair. You ever feel that way? You don't have to raise your hand. Just nod in your heart. That's the question. That's sort of the overarching question for what we're going to look at here this morning. Is God fair? Do we have a fair God? How do we know that? So if you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to read the few last few verses of that chapter. And the parable is in Matthew chapter 20. Now, if you know, if you haven't been with us, you don't know, we're in a year-long study called The Story of Jesus. And we are now in a smaller series in that study looking at a specific way Jesus taught by telling parables, stories with a spiritual truth. This one is known as the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. So Matthew 19, verse 27. Then Peter said in reply, See, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? We pause there for just a minute. He's replying to an encounter with the rich young ruler. You know that story? Rich man comes to Jesus and says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, obey the commandments. He goes, yeah, yeah, I've done all that. Oh, really? Jesus says, one thing still you lack. Go sell all you have, give it to the poor, then come follow me. And the guy goes away sad because he had great wealth. In other words, I don't know if I could do that. Peter then turns to Jesus and says, well, we've done that. We've left everything. What will there be for us? Let's pick it up in verse 28. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. 
But when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those who hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to the one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last worker as I gave you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. Now, a couple things this parable is not. This is not a teaching on fair wage disputes in our culture today. This is not a teaching on the minimum wage. This is not a teaching about labor practices and equity in the workplace. That's not what Jesus is teaching here. And some people have twisted this to mean things like that. Like most of his parables, Jesus is telling a story about one thing to teach about something else. The kingdom of God. It's called one of the kingdom parables because he begins by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like this story. He's teaching us something about what God's kingdom is like. Specifically, it's an answer to Peter's question in verse 27 of chapter 19, isn't it? What's in it for us, Jesus? What, is this, is this going to be worth it? I mean, we've made some sacrifices here. We've left everything to follow you. We've given up all that stuff you talked about. Is it going to be worth it? This is the question of reward. The question of reward. Is it going to be worth it? Do you ever ask that question in your mind? Is living the Christian life, doing all this stuff, is it worth it? I recently, uh, just actually this past Thursday, spent some time with a man named Ed Kapinski, goes to our East Campus, great guy, missionary in Indonesia for many years, translating the Bible into a, an indigenous language. And he told me about some friends of his that are ministering, that are, they're, they're, they're from Ethiopia and Somalia. And they're, they've given their lives to not only translating, but teaching the Bible and spreading the gospel in that region, right south in, in the, of the Horn of Africa uh, area of the world that many of you know is uh, highly Muslim and a very dangerous place for Christians to be. And on the application to join these guys in their mission is the question, are you willing to die for Christ? And it's not metaphorical. If you will, many of us know we will. Now, most of us here are never going to be asked to die for our faith. But if we're honest, we feel like there's some sacrifice to the Christian life, and we want to know what's in it for us. And to answer this question, Jesus says, let me tell you a story. Let me answer your question, Peter, with this story about what the kingdom of heaven is really like. It's a story about a vineyard. You see on the screen here an image of a vineyard. I took this picture when we were in Israel. This is a vineyard similar to the it would be in the first century. Not only flat, it's not all flat land there. The, the ground is terraced, uh, and they have to work hard at irrigation. But the, the implication, though it's not said specifically, is that this is harvest time, because you would not need this many workers unless you're bringing in the harvest. So it's harvest time, and he's getting all the workers, the laborers that he can to work in his vineyard. Now, throughout the Bible, when you see vineyards talked about, almost always the vineyard is a metaphor for the family of God, the blessing of God, the favor of God, the kingdom of God. So to be a worker in the vineyard is to be somebody called to serve the king in his kingdom. To receive his favor, his blessing, be given a role in the kingdom, in God's family. That's what the vineyard symbolizes. Now it's unusual in this story for the master to be the one who's out hiring. You notice later in the parable he has his foreman give the wages. He has his foreman pay. Ordinarily, you would have your foreman do the hiring. This is a very important man. Those who owned vineyards were extremely, not extremely, but very well off, upper middle class at least. He wouldn't be normally personally hiring. The point Jesus is making is in God's kingdom, nobody comes in unless they are personally called by the king himself. Notice, none of the workers show up knocking on the vineyard door. None of them beg to get in. All of them are called or invited in personally by the master. Now, for the first group, the early workers, 
<laughs> last night, Andrew Griffiths preached uh, this, this parable. We worked on it together. He's a young guy in our church. He preached this on this, and he's from England, from Newcastle, England. And he said, early workers, but it sounded like alley waggers. And so the lady comes to me afterwards and says, what are the, er, what are the alley waggers? I said, oh, those are the early workers. Anyway, <laughs> the early workers come into the kingdom. <laughs> I don't know, it makes me laugh. I don't know why I said that. The early workers come into the kingdom at, at early. The implication is 6 a.m. So a Jewish work day in the first century was 12 hours long, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Given Taking out uh, breaks for meals and for prayer and rest, it's about a 10-hour work day. Uh, so 6 a.m. is the early workers, the early waggers. They come in at 6 o'clock in the morning. He agrees to pay them a denarius for the day. You see an image here of the de uh, denarius, an ancient coin. This is the this is the basic rate of the basic uh, currency in the first century Roman coinage. That's Tiberius Caesar's face on there. This is a picture of a replica of what a denarius looked like in Jesus' day. This is, by the way, standard pay, standard day's pay for a Roman soldier. It's also standard day's pay for a skilled laborer, carpenter, stonemason, that kind of thing. So he agrees to pay them a denarius a day. He's actually being quite generous. To these workers because they're not skilled laborers they're hanging around hoping somebody will hire them just to you know do the hard grunt work so he's being very to these first workers they don't negotiate they don't object they're thrilled to get a denarius a day thrilled to go into the vineyard to work for the whole day at least at the outset for those hired the third hour 9 a.m the, the the sixth hour you know and so forth the ninth hour you just every three hour increments there 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., these are the times that he's hiring people. The master doesn't specify the amount. Notice that? He says, whatever is fair or whatever is right, I'll give you. And they just trust him. Maybe they heard about, hey, we gave those guys a denarius. We're going to get, it's going to be good. We have no other options. This is, he's a fair man. He's a generous man. So they trust him. Then the 11th hour, this is where the phrase comes from, the 11th hour, right? They're going to be hired for one hour of work. They're coming in at 5 p.m., Then the end of the day comes. And he gathers them all together. Tells his foreman, let's start with the last first. Remember how the two phrases bookend this parable? But the last will be first and the first last. Let's pay the, la the ones hired last first. We'll come back to that theme in a minute. Now, the, G the Jews of Jesus' day, before we get to this, they viewed life and their religion on a merit system. You get from God what you deserve. You, you receive from him what you, you get out of your religious life, what you put into it. God rewards the righteous. You work hard, you're faithful, you uh, go to temple and synagogue and offer the right sacrifices and avoid the sin and obey the law, and God will reward you. You get, out, you get out what you put in. And most religions work on this principle, the law of karma, right, for the Hindus. Obey, o obey the rules and you get something back. This is the promise of reward. What's in it for me? Well, for the Jewish mindset, whatever you put in, God will pay you back. Now imagine the shock and joy of those workers hired last. If you're one of those 11th hour guys, worked one hour. A denarius? That's over incredible. I get a full day's wage for a skilled worker, which I am not. It's, a, it's an overwhelming act of generosity. Now imagine the expectation of those hired first. They're watching. They're in line to receive their pay. They're going, wow, I guess he's changed his mind. I guess the deal's been renegotiated. What do you think? What, can you imagine whispering? What do you think, two denarius? No, maybe three? I mean, well, let's just calculate. Let's add it up. They're doing little math problems in their head as they wait their turn to get paid. As I said, most religions in the world work on the system of you get back what you put in. Let's go back to our original question for a minute. Is God fair? Is God going to reward you on the merit-based system? Is he going to give you what you deserve? Are you going to get back from him what you've put in to this Christian life? Now, why, why would those workers hired first expect more than a denarius? Why would you think? Why would they want more or expect more? They didn't expect more in the beginning, did they? What changed? Only when they saw what, how the owner treated the other workers. 
It was only in comparison to others that they began to expect something different. They began to rethink or renegotiate the deal in their minds, right? When they look at some, how someone else is treated, all of a sudden, wait a second. It wouldn't be fair if you only gave us a denarius. We've worked longer, so I'm sure we're going to get more. Why? Because I see what they got. There was no problem until they start, began to look at what someone else was, how someone else was treated. This brings us to the surprise of reward. And it's not necessarily initially a good surprise. He goes, Ellie Rabbit. The surprise of reward. That's going to stay in my head all day. Let's read um, verses 8 through 12 again in Matthew 20, the, the, the sort of the turning point of the story. And when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you've what? Listen to this. Made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Stop there. They grumbled. They asked, essentially, the question we asked at the beginning. This isn't fair. Is this fair? How is this fair? One hour versus 12 hours? This is not fair at all. You've made us equal. And clearly they believe we're not equal. Now let's be honest for a minute. Can any of you sympathize even a little bit with these early workers? Anybody? Yeah. How many of you feel? I get it. I think I might feel a little bit of that if I was in their shoes. I think this story works a little bit like a trap. Jesus tells this story to sort of trap you and expose parts of your heart when it comes to your relationship with him. And me too. It doesn't seem fair, we would say. It kind of cheapens the hard work we did all day if those guys can waltz out of here after one hour with the same pay. That sort of makes it like, well, what was the point? I would rather have hung around till five then. You know, if, that's, if I can just get a denarius for one hour, why'd I work all day? Notice, where's their focus? Where is the focus of the ones who are grumbling? Wait a minute. Anybody paying attention here? I worked all day. Hello? You know, like Bill Murray and Caddyshack. How about a little something for the effort? You know, doesn't seem fair. You're not treating us fairly. They aren't getting what they think they deserve based on how they stack up against other people. And if we're honest, every one of us has a part of our heart that feels that way. In life, you ever feel passed over by somebody else at work? But it doesn't you feel like that person, is they have the boss and everybody else knows. They do not deserve it. it their life is, and I know what goes on in, in their heart. And you feel, by comparison, I'm much better. We've all felt that way. We've all got a little part of our heart that looks at somebody else's life and says, they don't deserve what they're getting. I deserve better. If you view your life and your relationship to God like this merit system, if you think about your life this way, like I should be getting back what I put in, and if, if you view God this way, I should be getting more from God because I, I'm working hard for him. I'm not better than most of these people that I see around me. If you think of your life and your relationship to God that way, you will inevitably grow bitter and resentful. It's a dead-end road. It always happens. Why? Because you see it as a zero-sum game. For me to be blessed, someone else must get less. If they get more, that means I'm going to get less. Remember the older brother last week Pastor Brian preached to us about? Remember the story of the prodigal son, the older brother in the parable? Why was he mad when the father killed the fattened calf and gave back his inheritance? It's less for him, he feels. Wait a minute, you already gave him, and he blew it. Now you're giving him more? That's coming out of my pocket. I, if you see it this way, as a merit-based system, you feel like it's not fair, and I'm going to miss out, and your heart shrinks, and you grow bitter and resentful in life and at God. This attitude is fatal in God's kingdom. It's death to you. You can't live a life, the free, joy-filled life God wants for you if you feel this way, if you think this way, if you're worried about what you deserve, what's coming your way. If you're always keeping track, 
right? He's got a little mental account going all the time on the wrongs done to you and the things you've missed out on, and you're looking at other people, and you're adding up their accounts, and you, your heart just shrivels up and dies. God's saying, this, this has no place in my kingdom. It's a total missing of the point. And how tragic. Think about this for just a minute. How tragic that they're waiting in line and getting excited for what they will receive. When they don't receive it, they grumble, and they're mad about what the other people got. They don't even, there's no thought at all of them th- rejoicing. How aw- n- n- not once do they say, how awesome that those were hired last got paid so much. How good for them. How great for their family. How awesome and generous is the master that he would do that for them. They don't say that at all, do they? They say, oh, this is totally unfair. This is, this is not right. Something must be done, you know? Let's, uh, let me ask this question before we proceed. Why did the master keep going back? I mean, did this guy not know how to handle his business? Does he know how to calculate how many acres he has and how much work it's going to take? And why does he go back every hour to hire more people? Why? Not because he's a bad manager of the vineyard. It's because he's so gracious. Why? It's because he wants more people, more and more, to come in, to experience life in the vineyard, to receive the blessing. And these, those hired first totally missed it. I've said this before, but you would think, the longer you are around, you would think that when you come to faith in Christ, you're overwhelmed by his grace. You can't believe that God loves you and forgives you for all that you've done. And it's a gift of his grace. And you think the longer you're around church, the more you sing his praises, the more you learn his truth, the more you're around other believers who experience the same thing, the more your heart would grow. Wouldn't you think that would be true? What's your experience of church people, generally speaking? What's your experience of those who've been around a long time? Are they always the most joyful? Present company excluded, of course. Not always. Not always. Sometimes those of us that have been around the longest our heart shrinks because we stop seeing it the way God wants us to see it. We start thinking Yoza. We start thinking this isn't fair. Let's look now at the true reward. What's really going on here? The true reward. Let me read again verses 13 through 16, the last little bit of the parable here, because this is really the key to understanding it all. Verse 13. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last to the worker as I give you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. The key to understanding this parable is this exchange between the workers and the master. What he says to them. He calls them friend, but it's got a little bit of a bite to it. I'm doing you no wrong, some of your Bibles might say. I've not been unfair to you. I haven't treated you poorly. You're not missing out. Now notice the master never justifies himself, does he? He never gives reasons. He simply says, I choose to. I choose to do this. I have that right. In other words, the point is, God's rewards are not based on what you do, but on who he is. Think, remember that. The blessings God gives us are not based on what, on your merit or what you do. They're based on his character and love and grace. So not, you don't get what you deserve. So you should be grateful. You get who he is and what he wants to give you. He asked this question. Do you begrudge my generosity? That's the English Standard Version, which I was reading from. The New International Version, different translations of the Bible, says, Are you envious because I'm generous? The New American Standard Bible, another translation, English translation, says, Is your eye envious because I'm generous? Literally, in the Greek, the word means, Is your eye evil? You ever heard the phrase, giving someone the evil eye? You know, this is, comes out of a Hebrewism in the Old Testament. The phrase evil eye in Hebrew meant a jealous eye, envious eye. An eye that looked at somebody else and thought, mm, I want that. I, I, I resent what they have because I want it for myself. That's the evil eye. That's what he's saying. Are you looking at these people? Is your eye turned bad? Because of my generosity. How tragic that the generosity of God would cause our eye to go bad. 
How tragic that the grace of God for someone else would make our heart shrink. Something is drastically wrong, isn't it, with that picture? If that happens to us, let me ask you this question. Can you rejoice? Do you freely rejoice when other people do well? When you see someone else being blessed and whatever, in their, in their work and, and with their kids doing great and whatever it is, do you, do you, does your heart sing and say, that's awesome? Or does part of you go, oh, my life would be like this. I wish I had that. Show of hands. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, I mean, every one of us. I have it. And that's what he's saying is, that's a problem. This is the trap part of the story. To catch us in our heart and say, pay attention to that. That's not good. You're missing the point. You're missing out on what God wants to give you. If your eye has gone bad and you look at everybody else and you're going, oh. This is what the true reward, we're getting to what the true reward really is now. There's something else here the master's answer uh, to their grumbling. He calls them friend. Now remember, what is the vineyard a symbol of? What does the vineyard symbolize? It symbolizes God's kingdom, God's family, God's blessing, God's favor. So this is sort of subtle, but it's in there. They view working in God's service, the master's service, as hard labor. But we're going to get paid. Right? There's no joy in their labor. It's, we had to do this, but you agreed to pay us, and now you're treating us unfairly. There's, there's not, it's not like, I get to work in the vineyard of the king. I get to serve this generous master. It's more like, I got to sweat it out. And hope it's worth it in the end. I know lots of Christians who view life this way. Got to sweat it out and struggle, but hopefully it'll be worth it in the end. That's not what God calls us to. He calls you to a life that's rich in the vineyard. The best possible place you could be is in his kingdom, serving that, this king. So do you see the life, the Christian life, the living for Christ as drudgery, as just, you know, a necessary hard work till you get paid in the end with heaven or something? Or do you see it as a joy to labor in his service, to give up things for him? Because there's no sacrifice at all because of the one who loves you. So working in the vineyard is part of the reward, in other words. It's the best possible life. Nobody deserves to be there. Nobody gets in because they earned it. They're all there by grace. And this, by the way, is why the payment is the same. Why does he pay them all the same? Because... Don't miss this. Everyone who comes into God's kingdom gets the full measure of his grace. Remember at the end of verse 29 and 19, he says they will inherit eternal life. What more could you get? So in other words, everyone who comes into God's vineyard or his kingdom gets the full dose. He doesn't even go, well, you're more righteous than she is. And he, well, you, you know, you know, Jeff, you get a little bit of grace, just a little tiny bit, right? No, he pours it out on all of us. The denarius is all of it. You all get all of it. You come in early, you come in late. I've never met somebody. I had a, a friend of mine named Sal uh, years ago who, who had lived a very broken life, uh, uh, dealing drugs, involved in gangs, and God radically saved him out of a real dark situation, and he was fond of telling his story. I never once heard him say, I'm so glad God let me have my fun for a while before he saved me. I'm so glad he let me get lost in drug addiction and in destroying my marriage and in going to prison. I'm so glad that happened so I could come in late. He didn't say that. You know, when we do baby dedications up here, and I'll I'll hold the child, and we pray, God, help this child come early in their life to know who you are. Why do we pray? You ever heard Pastor Brian and me pray, Lord, take your time, let this child have its fun, and then come to know you? We don't pray that way. Why? Because it's not... Those who miss out are not those who come in early, but those who come in late. They miss out on the joy of loving the king. Sal never once prayed that way. He always thanked God for saving him, even if it was the 11th hour. The thief on the cross didn't get away with it all. He got the full dose of grace, which was undeserving. And none of us deserve it. The system of law or merit is easy to figure out. You get what you deserve. You get what you put in. We understand that. That's how the world works most of the time. But Jesus is saying, that's not how my kingdom works. That's not the way my kingdom works. It's totally different than the way the world works. You don't get what you deserve. So is God fair? 
No. God is not fair. The end. <laughs> Think about it. God is not, if fairness is you get what you deserve, then our God is not a fair God. He is a generous God. And you should be praising him all, every, all day, every day, that he's not just fair to you. If he was fair to you, if you only got what you deserved, we are all in serious trouble. But he's not fair. He's unfairly generous. And that should make us celebrate him. Because this last little part, we think of ourselves as the early workers. But nobody is. Nobody in here is really the early worker. We are all the 11th hour ones. There's only one who's the early worker. You know who that is? Yes, it's the church answer. You can say it out loud. Jesus, think about this. He, spiritually speaking, is the one who's borne the heat of the day and the hard labor. He's the one who deserves you know, he, the cross. In fact, right after this parable, Jesus predicts, look at your Bibles, right after this parable, Jesus predicts his death. He talks about going to the cross. He wants his disciples to understand something. I am going to be betrayed and suffer at the hands of guilty men. Jesus, who is perfectly innocent, is going to die a sinner's death. Where's the fairness in that? Where's the fairness in the cross? That God himself, righteous and holiness in the flesh, would, would die in our place. Where's the fairness that God takes what we deserve? That's not fair. He doesn't deserve that. You do, and I do. God is not fair. He's radically generous. Jesus is saying, I'm going to the cross, not because I deserve it or you've earned it, but because I love you, and I'm a generous God. And I want to give you not what you deserve. I want to give you what I deserve. I want to give you my righteousness, my blessing, my glory. So I, I will take what you deserve, punishment, suffering, death, because of your sin. I'll take all that. That's not fair. And I'm going to give you all that I am, my love and my grace and my forgiveness and my mercy. That's not fair. But that's our God. That's the point of this parable. Let me ask you a few questions and we'll finish. Do you see that God calls and chooses us and not the other way around? You come into his vineyard because he called you. Do you see that we come on his terms, not ours? There's no renegotiating the deal. You get the best deal possible. Unfair generosity. Do you see how compassionate God is? He goes back and back and back to call more and more people. Do you rejoice with the good fortune of other people when God blesses them? Are you convicted by the reality that there's no place for the evil eye in God's kingdom? Are you humbled by the truth that we all receive far more than we deserve? Are you undone by the fact that Jesus came and took what you deserve to give you what you don't deserve, his blessing and his grace, eternal life? C.S. Lewis wrote in a book called Letters to Malcolm, the secret of the Christian life is to finally come to the place where you realize that it's all grace and to rejoice in that, not to resent it. To come to a place where you can say, it's all grace. I got in in the 11th hour. I don't deserve it, and neither do you. But we all rejoice. If you don't see yourself that way, then you're going to become bitter and resentful and think God is unfair. The truth is, he isn't unfair. He's generous. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this incredible story, which really penetrates our hearts. And I just ask for everyone here this morning, whether they've been in the vineyard for a long time or they have not even yet stepped in, you would press into our hearts the truth that you are a radically, unreasonably generous God. You pour out on us what we do not deserve, your blessing and your favor through Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.